Hello and welcome to another episode of Brave UX. I'm Brendan Jarvis, Managing Founder of The Space In Between, and it's my job to help you to put the pieces of the product puzzle together. I do that by unpacking the stories, learnings, and expert advice of world-class UX design and product management professionals. My guest today is Kate Towsey. If you've heard of Research Ops, you've most likely heard of Kate. She's the Research Ops Manager at Atlassian and the founder of the Research Ops community, which started with a tweet in 2018 and now has over 8,000 members. Before moving halfway across the world from London to Sydney in 2018 to join Atlassian, Kate spent the best part of a decade consulting to organizations as a content strategist, user researcher, and research operations pioneer. During that time, she worked for clients that included the University of Surrey, Pfizer, Boehringer, the BBC, and most notably, the UK government's digital service, or GDS as it's most commonly known. At GDS, Kate led the delivery of the tools, technologies, and environments that enabled the user research team to carry out great user research. While at GDS, her accomplishments included the design and delivery of the first user research lab, AV repository, and participant panel. Kate is currently working on a book called Research at Scale, the Research Operations Handbook, which will be published by Rosenfeld Media sometime in 2022. She's also the co-curator of Rosenfeld's Advancing Research Community. And today, it's my pleasure to have Kate here to speak with me about all things research ops. Kate, welcome to the show. Hello. It's great that's, to have you here. Great introduction. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, you did all the hard work there. I just, I just summarised your uh, your professional history, which is which is pretty impeccable. And in my travels around the internet, I discovered something that caught me by surprise when researching for this conversation. Apparently, you led a punk rock movement in Johannesburg. What is the story there? <laughs> I did. I seem to have this habit of creating communities. Um, so that was, gosh, I was 20, uh, 20 years old or 21 years old around about that time. And um, I went to London and someone took me to a, a punk rock gig with a, a band called Strung Out and uh, Lagwagon, I think it was, um, in Brixton. And um, I had been spending, I'd spent a lot of time in my life with skateboarders that just tended to be the kind of group that I hung out with and, and always gravitated towards. And uh, I, I just loved it and, I, and and the messaging behind it of, of independent free thinkers um, who really kind of considered how they were in the world was so appealing to me. And uh, I came back to Johannesburg after that month in London and I thought, why do we not have this here? And it was going to be my 21st birthday. And my parents said, well, you can either have a party or you can have a ticket overseas. And, I, and typical of me, I, I thought, well, I want both. And so um, my way of, of living in the world is uh, what is what would success look like and how do I achieve that? And, and I, I work on everything that way. And uh, this was no different. And so I thought, well, I'll organize a party for myself for free and uh, I will take my ticket overseas, which is what I did. So <laughs> I, I, I knew some Irish guys who were friends with uh, a pub owner. And uh, I said to him, look, I'll organize the bands and you... Um, you have the door on drinks. And he said, that sounds like a great deal. And uh, so the bands were very happy because the punk bands hadn't had anywhere to play for other than mm. their garages for, for years. And so um, that was the beginning of, of a movement because around, I guess, two or 300 people arrived, something like that. I don't know the exact numbers, but it was mm. absolutely packed. Um, and people looked at me and said, wow, that was an incredible evening. And when are we doing it again? And so... I was actually, um, I, I then sort of did this work with a friend of mine um, and we called it Beans on Toast, <laughs> um, which was the whole, this whole kind of thing about, uh, uh, you know, just sort of having the basics of life. And uh, it was very much from my point of view, um, a, I wouldn't say political statement, but it was certainly a statement around how you live your life and how you think about life. Um, and very soon, um, the bands loved me because uh, I was getting in 500 people into a venue. The venues loved me yeah. because I was bringing them business. Um, I just took the door at 10 bucks <laughs> an entry um, and split it all kind of uh, equally across the bands. Um, and somewhere in between that, I got involved in a band myself and, and got very well known in the kind of punk rock skateboard scene in South Africa um, for that work. So, yeah, it, it's sort of not a dissimilar story from um, 
the research ops community, other than the, mm. sort of the topic is different. But uh, uh, the, the same thing um, with with the punk rock thing that sort of re was repeated um, in 2019, I guess, was um, uh, it was uh, maybe a year or two after I'd started the community and it really started to grow. Uh, this is in the punk rock space that I remember mm. I was at a gig DJing at one of the gigs after the bands played and, and some kids got, got up on stage and were just being real, like, really... I don't know if you're allowed to swear on this podcast. Go for it. Go for it. Real assholes. They were being real assholes about, they were just being so judgmental of people who were not like them. And I thought, you know, you're this like little shit with your, your Toyota Corolla parked out in the parking lot and your designer gear bought for you, you know, your parents bought this for you. <laughs> and now you're standing on stage and judging the world. And uh, it really annoyed me because it was exactly the opposite of, of what I'd wanted to create. And so mm -hmm. I didn't have the maturity at that point to, look at it and see it as an opportunity to um, really kind of make something of it and turn the conversation around. And um, instead, I was just so angry, I walked away from the whole thing and, and never um, ran another gig again. Mm. Um, now, the same didn't happen. We didn't have rude people in research ops at all. <laughs> That's <laughs> going to last. Yeah, no, no, this, this was not the same thing. But, but I started that community, um, again, with that same ethos of, of openness and uh, equality, I really went out of my way to draw people in from across the world. So it, it didn't become a, a, an entirely Euro US conversation, which is what it always is. Mm. Um, and really wants to acknowledge that there are, there are research practices that perhaps have a different style and, and different needs across the world. Mm. Um, but it, it grew so quickly that I, when I moved to Australia and started working for Atlassian, which was a 5,000 person organization at that point. Um, the research ops community was around 5,000 people. And I guess it was about a year and a half old, so not that old, and a lot of work, a huge amount of work, self-made, <laughs> but a huge <laughs> amount of work. And I realized I'm trying to move country, start up a team in a new organization and deal with that and run a community that's now basically the size of the company I work for. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I knew that I was never going to be able to do all of that well. And I, I just don't like to do things not well. And I don't like to be impersonal either. I'm not very good at that. I like to have one-on-one -on -one conversations. I like to really engage with, with the people that, I'm, that I've brought together. Mm -hmm. And so I stepped away from it. Similarly to, to the same thing I stepped away from in, in my early 20s mm. um, but uh, Bridget Metzler and the, the group of people that we had brought together called uh, which was affectionately and is still affectionately called the cheese board um, <laughs> which was a, kind of a play on actually it was Andrew um, Meyer who came up with that once in a conversation with him and he was and we were like what's like a cheese platter uh, <laughs> and so um, it's still called the cheese board and uh, they've taken it on they've, they've, they've run it since I think it's 2019 or 2020 something like that mm -hmm. um, and done a superb job of it so I, I can't take credit for the, the 8,000 people are there that are, that are there now um, but uh, you know you can call me the fire starter yeah, you're the, the lone dancer on the hillside that uh, eventually someone else comes and joins you and you've started this, this wonderful movement yeah, yeah, exactly so looking at your journey to where you are now at, at Atlassian, you do have a bit of a punk attitude that seems to flow through some of the milestones in your career. And you sort of touched on it just earlier there where you seem to look at the status quo and regardless of whether you've got any experience in whatever that status quo is, you set out to change it and you seem to be quite successful at doing that. How do you think about what you've achieved? Uh, I can only ever ask, answer questions by the first, usually I have an image that will come into my head and uh, um, this is going to seem like a very, very uh, like weird response, so, but bear with me as I work through it. So <laughs> uh, after the punk rock um, movement and kind of several other journeys in life, um, I ended up in India and spent time studying with a group of, studying is a strong word, kind of just hang out with a group of very esoteric yogis in North India in Nepal called the Aghori Babas. Mm -hmm. And they're known for being real radicals in the sense that uh, traditionally in India, like white is, a, is um, you know, there's many connotations with it, but, but in the, the world of yoga, it's like the sort of purity and renunciation. And they wear black 
Um, they're very, very, they're the anarchists of the yoga world. They wear skulls and crossbones and uh, they even, you know, they dress with chains and things that you might associate with punk rock. Um, so <laughs> I found it very interesting that I've ended up spending time with these people and gone really well with them. If you, if you Google them, you'll kind of see pictures of them. They're pretty radical. Did you bring um, a lag wagon CD with you for yeah. them to listen to? <laughs> yeah, I should have brought Rancid. Rancid was definitely, <laughs> definitely my choice. I still love Rancid even to this day. Uh, Outcome the Wolves. If you if you want to hear a really really kind of timeless punk rock album, Outcome the Wolves is is the one to listen to. We'll put in, that in, in the show notes. Yeah, in in my opinion. Um, but actually, we're going on a road trip today, so, so that one might come out. Um, <laughs> and so you know, there's this there's something that is intriguing to me about. Um, and I think you know, just built into me, which is really attracted to that ability to step outside of the bounds of what we consider to be done and not done, um, and leave all that uh, structure, that kind of social structure behind to become truly creative. Mm. Um, and so possibly it's something that's fascinated me throughout my life, and possibly that's what comes into into the work that I do as well. Um, I don't tend to take no for an answer on an idea. And I remember even when I started the the research ops community and I spoke to a few people who have now actually become great supporters um, at the time, they said, it won't work and you can't do it. And mm. it's just kind of like, it's just not going to work. Um, and, I, and the plan that I was kind of saying is sort of expressing, I wasn't asking for permission, but I was just saying, like, this is what I want to do. I, I want to really kind of get people around the world. We're researchers. Let's research what it means to do research and what we need to be able to do it well, um, mm. efficiently at its scale, and who better to do that research than researchers on researchers around the world. <laughs> um, and uh, I, I'm kind of going to get all these people running these research sessions and get all this data together and just make it as this big kind of global research project. Um, and mm. and I was told it wouldn't work, and I th I just thought I just feel like it is, and what have I got to lose? Uh, a little bit of ego, <laughs> maybe I'll look like an idiot. Uh, <laughs> That's but the punk attitude right there. Uh, there's not much to lose here, really. So um, you know, it, it, the, the same people have, as I said, become kind of really great supporters, and uh, have re really one day turned around and said, "Wow, yeah, it's it's quite amazing that this worked out." Um, mm -hmm. But you know, it definitely takes a it takes a very particular energy and mindset for that kind of work. And I can't claim that I'm in that space all the time. Um, mm -hmm. it, it, it takes a, a real sense of playfulness uh, to be able to throw yourself into something and realize that you might just burn <laughs> and that that's <laughs> totally fine, that there really is nothing to lose. Um, and and that, that you're not wanting to own every part of it, um, which is it's definitely a mindset. Um, I can't, yeah. Uh, there are definitely times when I feel like I want to be more in control of everything and own it more, and that's not when I do that kind of work. Mm. Um, so a lot of my time is spent trying to either get to that mind space or keep myself there because uh, that's that's I feel where where the most magical work can happen. Mm. Um, not doesn't necessarily earn you the most money or anything any at all, but it's uh, the most interesting and fun work. If you're listening to this today, then if you remember one thing from this podcast, what Kate has just said is probably what you should remember. Mm -hmm. And I wondered how much of this sort of attitude that you've taken, this starting things, not needing to own things, um, getting stuck in and, and building belief and a change to the status quo, how much of that is a result of your fine arts background? Mm. Well, you have done your research. Uh, yeah, and I think previous to that, I was um, educated in a Rudolf Steiner background, mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's actually funny. My partner, um, he was also educated Rudolf Steiner, but in New Zealand, and I was in South Africa, mm -hmm. and uh, we'd been seeing each other for maybe three or four months, and then um, we were just like, wow, so similar in the way we think about things, <laughs> and then one day I brought it up that I'd, I'd spent, uh, you know, I'd, I'd been educated in a Rudolf Steiner school, mostly for most of my, my, my schooling life. And he said, me too. And we realized that that's where that sort of similar mindset of creativity and thinking outside the box comes from. Um, if you don't know anything about Rudolf Steiner, um, I don't necessarily advocate it as an education system for everybody, but it's mm -hmm. very um, unruled and uh, you literally, you don't have pages with lines on it. So you can mm -hmm. write and draw whatever you want. You don't have to write in straight lines. You can write however you want and you can write in any color and you could write with a picture as opposed to words. Um, you don't have to pass exams at the end of each year like you do in, in a kind of a, a sort of a, a regular school. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there's a lot of um, craft and creativity and a lot of space for you to kind of do things in your own way. 
Mm. Um, so you can, I, I think it was probably more that foundation um, that that perhaps shaped my brain and the way it works than fine art. But then certainly fine art was particularly in the era that I went and did a fine art degree. It, it's, it wasn't about can you paint well and sculpt well. In fact, I was very disappointed because I signed up to this course coming from a, an artistic family. And uh, I think I did maybe like th two weeks of painting and then the rest was all conceptual art. And I used to have massive wars with the head of the department. Uh, I literally, one of my projects I made was a voodoo doll of the department, um, <laughs> which I did get called into the office for. Um, and, and and looking back, I think it was a, a like a juvenile attempt at any kind of conceptual art, but it did make a statement. And uh, And I said to him, I just feel like, you know, you're sending me out into the world with no real art experience. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not being taught how to draw or how to do anything practical. Mm -hmm. um, but what I didn't realize what they, they were what they were doing over those four years was sending me out into the world with a very kind of creative brain um, and, and, and teaching me how to process things from a, an initial idea to a more complex idea, mm -hmm. um, which I assume everybody can do, but um, perhaps that is something that comes from, from that training. Yeah, I, th I think it it is, a good assumption to make about the world that everyone can do that. But the, the more that I reflect on our education system in general, in the West in particular, mm -hmm. the less convinced I am of that and of the effectiveness of the model that we pursue. And so it's interesting to hear that you went to Rudolf Steiner and then pursued fine arts because it really does join a lot of dots for me uh, now that you've told me that. You also joined a couple of dots for me there about your partner being from New Zealand because I noticed right. that at UXR Conf 2019 in Toronto, you were wearing a t-shirt with uh, yes. New Zealand's national bird <laughs> on it, the Kiwi. And yeah. it was was that the significance? Was it was it sort of through your partner that you came to that t-shirt? Yes, it's true. So uh, <laughs> very soon after I met him, gosh, it must have been, I think we'd been seeing each other for three or four weeks. And and it's sort of crazy that sounds now even to us. We we booked a a trip three months later to to travel around New Zealand and uh, such a beautiful country um, as you would know. Um, and so yeah, I bought that T-shirt in um, Maria Springs because I have an absolute love affair with with hot springs um, and anything that's like watery and warm, like a bath. <laughs> but but uh, uh, yeah, such a beautiful country. So I've ended up with sort of an unexpected connection to it. Hmm. So something else that stood out about you, Kate, was that you had to leave eight years of contracting behind you. And, and now that we've sort of got into your background, I can get an idea for why you might have preferred to be a contractor or more of a free agent. But what was it about Atlassian that you thought it was worth leaving life in London and moving back to the Southern Hemisphere halfway across the world? That's a, it's a great question. Um, sometimes I wonder myself, but <laughs> it, it has been a, a very, very good move. Um, I, London had been there for, um, I guess, around 11 years um, and, and really built up my career there from uh, someone who had really gotten kind of, I'd been a journalist and, and then head off to India at some point and gotten completely stuck and involved in the yoga world um, mm. for better and for worse. Uh, some amazing, amazing experiences there. Um, and, and in between that had gotten involved in e-commerce and, and operationalizing e-commerce um, sites. Uh, I would not have called it operationalizing until kind of eight years ago. And now I realize that's what it was. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, when I moved to London, that's when I really started to get back into building up my career again after kind of getting getting lost in, in India and in, in meditation and so on and so forth. Um, but it was time to leave. It was really time to have a new adventure, to go um, seeking new experiences. And certainly from so, so country-wise, that was appealing. And I, and I was very happy to come back to the Southern Hemisphere and um, experience warmth again and just what it means to walk out the door and, and have mm. that sense of like overwhelming warmth around you because I, I, love, I love the heat. <laughs> um, so that was an easy one. Um, and I'd never been to Australia. I'd never thought about going to Australia and I'd never been further east than India. Um, so 
um, all of that, I, I felt like, you know, again, it's a theme of like, what do I have to lose? <laughs> Not a lot. I didn't have uh, any kind of like uh, serious relationships or it was kind of a, a whole lot of furniture that I could put on a boat for free and kind of get it shipped over here. And that was kind of my massive commitment. Mm -hmm. um, so so there was really, again, that sense of adventure and what, do I have, what have I got to lose? Mm -hmm. um, but the second thing, which was, I, I'd realized as, as consulting and certainly through my kind of at that point early work with the research ops community, was that to, to really understand the work of research operations, you have to deliver an entire ecosystem for it. Um, it's not just about one tool, um, but that, that full understanding is about an entire space that so really starts to then impact on, on research culture. And that's where the, the magic and, and, and the wizardry starts to happen. Um, and so it, to, to, you, it, you can't do that as a consultant necessarily because you're in there delivering a thing, a lab, hmm. a panel, and then you walk away from it and uh, however it is absorbed or spat out, like, you know, you, when they put a new heart into someone and, and um, or a new organ, and sometimes it's accepted and other times the immune system rejects it. It's a little, <laughs> it feels a little like that when, when you're delivering this kind of thing and then walking away from it as the surgeon. Mm -hmm. um, but but when you get in there and you're part of the body and you're part of the organization, you 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 have that ability to have the long-term impact. And I felt that in order to really understand this work and the way that it was building up, um, I mm. needed to I needed to find a playpen, like a sandpit. Mm -hmm. um, and it was around about that time that, that Lisa Raykel got in touch with me and said, hey, what, what would you think about coming to work for Atlassian in Australia? And I, I thought, Atlassian, okay, that's, you know, it sounds like an interesting company. <laughs> um, I know a little bit about Jira and Confluence. And then I thought, Australia, Southern Hemisphere, developed country. Um, I've spent a lot of time in, in Africa and in India, so mm -hmm. I, I sort of know the importance of these things. Um, and sunny, um, let's go. <laughs> so, so it sort of weighed up all those things. Um, but, Sounds but, terrible. I know. <laughs> um, so yeah, I guess, I mean, I always joke with Australia that it's so far east, it's west. Um, <laughs> you don't quite know where you are in the time zone. But um, it's been an interesting experience. I would say that I'm still very much of a, a a contractor mindset, um, mm. and I and I, I would be lying, um, and, and my colleagues at Atlassian know that I'd be lying if I if I said that I don't miss the world of contracting in that sense of freedom. But there are there are certainly big benefits that come with being with continuity and uh, consistency, and uh, it's not for me about security. I've never had the same needs for that. Um, but mm. uh, yeah, it's that 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 consistency of knowing that uh, you can actually build up a team, and as a team, you can deliver more than you would as a contractor. Um, you, you know, with some dollars behind you. Yeah, got it. I, I was reading an interview that you gave on the Customer Insights blog, and I noticed that you set a time minimum of four years at Atlassian. What was significant about giving Atlassian at least four years of Kate <laughs> Kelsey? That's interesting. Um, some of that is is practical in the sense that my visa, my original visa was four years. Um, mm -hmm. uh, it still is. Well, I've, I think I've got an hour, a year and a bit left on it. Um, mm. But uh, yeah, so I had the sort of mindset of, of four years was the visa um, and there's various other things like equity and things like that that roll out over four years um, when you commit to Atlassian. Mm -hmm. But there's also, um, I know from uh, delivering on research shops and particularly now, I mean, I've sort of proven it to myself that uh, when I contracted at, at GDS at the Government Digital Service, um, it ended up being a three-year contract that was sort of mm -hmm. broken up into many six-month contracts. And uh, it, it took me that long to really deliver something that started to look like a more complete environment. And, and I knew from that how, how long it would take me to do something similar in, in, this, in, in the space of um, Atlassian. Mm -hmm. um, and, so, and, and it's proven right that we're, I've now been there two, sort of 2.8 years, I think I worked out the other day mm -hmm. um, for, for another talk. Um, and uh, I feel like I've delivered a lot of the environment and there's sort of one element left um, that, that needs to be brought in that would take me another, probably another year to deliver, which does kind of really come up to a four year a uh, huge um, investment and shift in how research is done within the organization and, and what kind of efficiencies that we've managed to put in place and, and how we've grown with and supported the growth of the research team at the same time, because obviously uh, nothing, everything's in flux. And so you've mm. got to keep moving with the changes. Mm. So when you arrived, what did research ops look like versus what it looks like now? 
Yeah, um, I've actually got a, a talk um, that I'm sort of doing at the moment, uh, which goes through the story. And my analogy for it is is that uh, when I first arrived, it was really like a desert. Um, <laughs> and and the, the, the desert was, um, there was one person here doing um, some recruitment and some admin. Um, I will make this point probably until the day I die, um, or at least the day I, uh, my interest in research ops dies, if that ever comes. But um, uh, research operations is operations, not administration. Um, a lot of people get that confused, and what they do is they'll hire a junior person who is an administrator at the very most um, to come in and do some like personal assistance and administration for researchers. And then they wonder why they're not seeing the kind of bigger strategic um, opportunities unfold with that that research ops has to offer. And mm -hmm. the simple story is is that you kind of you get what you pay for, and then when you've got it, you get how you implement it. <laughs> and uh, and uh, so you know then you, you've got one person, but they're like you know one person can look after maybe five researchers. They're never going to scale beyond that. Mm -hmm. um, and so I came in. There was also at that point an internal um, panel that had just been started, and a, a good job had been done of that, but very hard to access it and actually use it without that one admin person actually being the, the only port of entry into that space. Mm -hmm. um, and that was pretty much it, a couple of main tools and, and nothing else. So somewhat of a desert, you know, a few sand dunes, maybe a little sprig popped up here and there, <laughs> and that's it. Um, and so I, I uh, sort of the short version of it is that was 2018 and 2019, I, I got a, a team member, then a um Learned a very important lesson in that I, I not knowing how many um, people were doing research at Atlassian, um, I call those PWDRs, people who do research, which mm -hmm. can include anyone who does research, uh, researchers, designers, content designers, engineers, you name it, someone who does research. Um, and it's important there, it's sort of something that we and other research ops teams have been bumping into is, ah, okay, so people who do research, but what is research? Because, uh, you know, chatting to a customer once a week, is that research? Um, or is research that distinct, is it a distinct definition of having a cohort of people who you, um, who are, are from a defined demographic, who you then spend a planned amount of time with, with a discussion guide, who you then do an analysis on those conversations and you synthesize and you come out with a set of, of insights. Uh, um, mm. Is that research with a royal, you know, it's, it's sort of, someone said to me the other day, that's royal research with a capital R. <laughs> and then on the other side, you've got research, which is, um, could be also defined as curiosity, which is a wonderful thing. Um, or empathy even, which is also mm. wonderful. And all these things are so important in all spheres of, of research. But does it make research to chat to a customer once a week and feel close to their needs? Um, and does it make research to to spend time being curious about someone's experience on an ad hoc basis? So, What did you decide? We, um, we haven't fully decided yet. Um, okay. We, from a scoping point of view, like there's a lot of stuff that then falls outside of our remit as research ops if we're going with Royal R. Um, and we're looking, sort of, we're leaning very closely into that and going, this is the kind of stuff for now that we look after. But the other side is like the force is strong from the other side as well. <laughs> there are a huge amount of needs there that are pulling us into how do we support product managers, especially in yes. in doing the work that they do and, and think of as research. Um, um, and you know they are learning from customers. It's you know mm. there's sort of it's a it's it, I think there's a there's a debate that needs to happen there. Um, how do we support them as well, and what sits within our remit? Because what it can easily become is just contacting customers, and everybody does that. Like my mm. team would sink if we suddenly had to own contacting customers in a huge organization, <laughs> um, and no one's actually asking us to do that. Um, but it could easily become that. So you could see how the 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 waters can become muddy. Yeah, I mean it's a a massive undertaking mm. and you talked about the definition of royal research versus speaking with customers this might seem like a crazy thing to ask you this far into the conversation so forgive me if it is but how do you define research ops mm. um gosh it's funny because i would have given you like a, a sort of a rote quoted response from our research <laughs> in 2018 but i think I sort of heading Sort of been several years later. Um, I don't have a short sentence, but uh, the it it is twofold. I think the initial thing that people think of, which is not wrong, 
um, it's just limited, is um, providing all the tools and processes. And this is the, the, the definition that I, I had in 2018 and that we as research ops community have put together. Um, so it's mm. all those, those, those processes and the tools and the infrastructure and technology, all that stuff that is needed um, to be able to get research done. And if you provide that to researchers so that they don't have to think about um, procurement and finances and where's the money coming from for me to use this vendor, mm. if they don't need to think about those things, they can focus, continue to focus on the work of doing research, which is what they're good at and what they're hired to do. Uh, researchers aren't always like experts on on um, information security. Where whereas, although we're not privacy specialists or lawyers, we pick up a huge amount. Um, and the same goes for procurement and finance. We now know, mm. you know, we we know all the words and we can speak the lingo like well enough to have intelligent conversation um, with these kinds of partners on a day to day basis. And so I think of us as the API that sits between um, the research organization and the rest of the world. So that the researchers don't need to hear all the language. We just send them the relevant pieces in the relevant language. Okay. Um, and so we, we perform that function. But where the, where the power of research operations really comes in, and this is when you start to get to a um, much higher level of maturity, which you can only achieve when, depending on your size, when you have someone who's experienced and knows what they're doing and is more senior, mm. um, you, you start to have um, palpable um, change on culture and how research is done and seen in an organization through the tooling and the processes that you introduce. And that can be for better or worse. And so the... The, the wizardry and the magic then comes in understanding and learning um, through almost through AP testing and your own kind of internal research and experimentation. If we put this tool in, uh, how does that, what impact that does that have on, on, on how people view research and the kind of insights and the quality and the value of insights that they're generating? Um, mm. and, and that can be seen in so many different ways. Um, so as an example, um, something that I've been thinking about a lot recently um, which I call the candy floss versus carrots um, kind of theory. <laughs> this is entirely made up. Is that unmoderated research is wonderful? You know, candy floss is wonderful when you're. In, you know, if you were dying of like sh sugar deprivation, um, or that, then candy floss could save your life, right? <laughs> okay. Don't like if anyone's a, like a medical professional, you, you might disagree with me, but take it as an analogy. It could save your life. If you were stuck on the side of the mountain and some angel had to come down with candy floss and you haven't had food for five days, this could be your lifeline. It's wonderful. In If you're in a like a fair, like one of those kind of circus places, um, candy floss is super fun and it's just perfect for the context, fun stuff. But as your day-to-day -day diet, it could give you diabetes and kill you and mm. it would give you no nourishment. And so what unmoderated tooling can become is in the wrong context and with the addiction, the addictiveness and the speed, the kind of high energy speed it can give you, it can become like a candy floss mm -hmm. and research is, should, is, is seen as it needs to be fast and instant. And I put something up today and in a day or two, I come and download a report. Fantastic for quick validation of something, a quick test that then goes into more intensive research. Mm -hmm. um, where on the other side, you've got carrots against the candy floss. And so, uh, although I've been told this is not correct, uh, carrots are apparently good for your eyes and help you see in the dark. Sight is such an important thing for research, gives you insight. Cheesy, I'm pushing the analogy too far. But, but I'm it's, with you. It's, I'm still with you. You're with me. It's a, it's a healthy food. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's times when, um, when this is exactly what you need. And this is moderated research, which takes more time. You've got to chew it a bit. You've got to, you might have to peel the carrots and so on and so forth. It's not instant. It's like longer term digestion, the whole thing. Mm -hmm. um, but it brings you a lot of nourishment. Um, and so neither is good or bad. It's all about context. Um, but what, what we found was that by having unmoderated tool in a space that is sugar addicted, that then becomes, it's just this addiction that everyone's just throwing everything into unmoderated testing all the time and not considering mm -hmm. that there is something called carrot. And so, um, aside from um, these tools becoming just extraordinarily expensive um, and, and various other things having an impact on our choices, uh, we've recently moved unmoderated research out and brought in tooling that is enabled 
Atlassians who do research, um, we call them AWDRs, mm-hmm. um, to be able to do unmo- to do moderated research in ways that are more easy. Um, so we've got a, a platform, Use Interviews Recruit, that enables more easy recruitment um, for Atlassians. Um, mm. We've got a way of managing thank you gifts that are very easy. They submit a ticket to us and we handle it for them. And we send various types of thank you gifts, charity and swag boxes and e-gift cards and various things. Mm-hmm. Um, we've got a lot of guidance and training on how to do good quality moderated research. And the point is that um, over time, with what we are seeing is that there is now like a, a love of carrots is emerging. <laughs> where mm-hmm. There's a real sense of like, wow, this is really nourishing and it tastes good. And although it takes a bit more time and it's a bit more energy to kind of chew through, like I feel like I've got some more energy out of this. And so... This is where the kind of environment that you you deliver can alter people's tastes in a sense. Um, and so the the vision is that one day you reintroduce candy floss, and so you've got lots of you've got sweets and you've got carrots and you've got lots of different food types there, um, and people have the ability to be able to choose the appropriate thing at the right time. Mm-hmm. Um, so this is you know like that was my obviously like highly extended answer to your very simple question of what is research shops. Um, but I think the what I'd love to see is that the sort of mindset of it just being tooling and infrastructure and all that sort of practical stuff and the uh, sort of admin around research that that uh, leadership particularly see that there is a real opportunity as as we have it at Lassian to partner with um, your operations team on how you you um, master the culture that is happening um, within mm. your organization around research. Yeah, you mentioned research culture earlier on in the conversation and this analogy with carrots and candy floss is is actually quite interesting it made me wonder when did you realize that there was uh, an addiction to candy floss and what were the clues that people in other organizations might want to look for that Mm. their their diet needs a bit of a rebalance Mm. Um, a lot of it can be, um, it's the only type of research happening unless there's a researcher involved. Um, mm-hmm. Anyone working in research knows that uh, we have lots of different ways of like methodologies or approaches to research because they all needed and are valuable. Um, and unmoderated has its place, moderated has its place, secondary research or desk research has its place, and so on and so forth. Uh, working, you know, remote has its place versus lab, and so, um, and diary studies have their place too. So there's there are, you know, the other sort of to stick to the sort of food dining analogy. You know, we've you sit at a restaurant and you got like a spoon and a fork and a knife, and they're all valuable and used for different things during your meal. So um, I think. One of the first things you notice is that there is like this like real desire and need just to use that one thing, and no one's picking up any other th- anything else that is on offer and available. Um, I think for a lot of people, but certainly in the tech spaces, um, these these spaces work at such an incredible speed. Mm. It's boggling. It is so fast, and there are so many demands on everybody to move fast and get things done. Um, it's almost like innate to the culture, and I know this is not unique to Atlassian. There's many many places that are like this. Um, that you will tend to like reach for the fastest thing, right? Mm. So, um, yeah, I, I don't know if I'm answering your, your question right, but you'll see the signs. I mean, the, one of the first things is that no one's doing moderated research, and when you speak to them, they say it's too hard. Mm. And some of it is that um, it's time, and and it's getting team understanding and culture around the notion that actually. Um, sometimes, not always, but sometimes taking that time gives you m- more energy and mm. more insight at the end of the day than you might get through a whole lot of um, kind of candy floss exercises. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we've spoken about what research ops is, and it sounds like in the last couple of years, your working definition of that is is evolving and is still taking shape. Is there anything that you now believe is not research ops that you once did believe was? Mm. I'd love to go back to um, my analogy of the desert um, because out of that desert, I just started and we got sort of, I I got sidetracked with um, the story of, I hired one person who was a a participant recruitment specialist Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I thought, this is great. I'm going to say to all these Atlassians who do research, I didn't know how many there were. Uh, I set up a service desk on Jira service desk. And I said, if you need a research participant, we will recruit and pay for it for you. It will all that you need to do dangerous. is like put in a ticket. Exactly. And uh, um, I, I really 
at that point, for some reason, I don't know if it was because I'd like just arrived in a brand new country and was doing too many things, hadn't really thought through the, the notion of like what was the supply demand <laughs> in that. Um, but I'm happy to admit this is a mistake because this is how you learn very quickly. And so essentially what I set up was a full service desk for an unknown number of people, not even really understanding what it takes to deliver on a recruitment project because I'd set up tools, but never as a consultant set up a, a an ongoing kind of person to service like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, very, very soon, um, I learned that there were far many, uh, far more people wanting the service than than I had capacity for, and that it, it takes at least you know, one recruit, recruit, excellent recruiter with uh, um, pretty dodgy operations behind her um, could deliver on. I think we I sort of said it was ten or something projects like that um, a month. Anyway, it wasn't. Um, we had like dozens and dozens of these things queuing up. <laughs> so uh, definitely a big lesson there um, to, to look at supply and demand and to be very aware of a full service service because scaling full service or what some people call a white glove approach, I don't love that terminology, mm-hmm. um, is very, very, very tricky. And what I eventually um, calculated and learned also from other people in industry who have delivered this as full service is that if you're going to look after 300 people who do research, um, you need, in order to deliver full service participant recruitment, you need a team of 40 to 45 to 50 people, mm-hmm. for sure. There's no mm-hmm. getting around that, which then suddenly means, uh, you know, like managers and sub-managers and, and just, it's, you know, it's a, it's a massive deal. Mm-hmm. Um, so I call that my Miss World moment because I, I felt that on reflection that I, what I really said was like Miss World uh, when she takes her crown says, well, this, I'm going to deliver world peace in my year of rain. <laughs> And uh, <laughs> it was as ridiculous as that. Um, but we, we, I pulled that service back very, sort of very quickly after realizing what a mess it was going to be and um, realized at that point that the only way I was going to deliver anything that was going to scale was to go fully self-service. Um, and so we, in fact, went underground as an ops team and started procuring and exploring and putting together fairly kind of at that point, rough services to and, and handbooks and mm-hmm. guidance and stuff like that to enable just the by then the 40 researchers in the in the research team to be able to self serve participants um, mm-hmm. and self serve um, informed consent and video libraries and everything. And so we did a bunch of work on that and became really for at least six months um, to uh, maybe nine months invisible to the research team and invisible to the rest of the organization. It was like we disappeared overnight. Uh, and we needed to to make that investment and I needed to get trust from the people around me um, and my team that uh, who might have thought, oh, my gosh, like, am I going to actually be seen to be performing under this person who's leading me into the dark? Um, but we, we we did it and it meant that we soon uh, rolled out services to the research team, um, which uh, went from 40 to 50 and is now, I think, 60 or so. Mm-hmm. Um, but about six months later, we realized that um, it would be a good time to start rolling it out and seeing if we could roll the same services, which were now uh, minimized and, and um, kind of well set out to Atlassians who do research. And so I returned back to the wider organization, but this time with a self-service model that had been mm. to some degree tested. And so I look at going from a desert where there were no operations to my Miss World moment, to then doing a ton of procurement with the researchers and ending up with something of a jungle with very little signage. And so you see, they, they couldn't find their way. There were too many processes. It was hard to onboard. Like they had to have a machete to even see where they might be going. Um, so then realizing that, well, actually we overdid that. And so we started to cut back and put in pathways and signage um, and, and create like a national park, a beautiful Australian national park or the kind that you see in the States where there's just, mm. and in New Zealand, with lovely signs and, you know, it warns you about a bear you might come in, in into like contact with at some point or, yeah. you know, go this way to go to the waterfall. And so that's what our operations looked like as of last year. Mm-hmm. And then this year we've rolled out to now 400 Atlassians who do research as a team of six ops people. And we're doing fine. And, and uh, it's people are self-serving and, and kind of getting that carrot to go back to that analogy. They're getting mm-hmm. um, that experience of being able to recruit and store data um, in the right place and do analysis and synthesis in a tool um, and have thank you gifts sent for them and have training with an excellent um, educator and have a handbook and and things like that. But the thing that we added to our national park is we got in like park rangers that can take people on tours or or help them out at at difficult corners. Um, And those are our research champions and they are designers um, who um, have uh, volunteered their time to be our research champion in their team 
And so they sit between my team and the 400 Atlassians who do research who are using our services. And um, they are literally like park wardens. They signpost, they tell people to pick up their rubbish when they need to. Mm -hmm. um, they help prioritize, um, they help plan journeys. Um, and that has been a real, real game changer. Um, and and I think that the next thing we're going to be doing is kind of having the, the national park uh, where now our, our sort of next port of call is really looking at um, much more complex systems um, integrated with uh, Atlassian Data Lakes, for instance, about like how do we manage customer data and manage customer relationships in terms of research? Because that's kind of mm -hmm. uh, for any enterprise, it's a real, really sticky area. Um, and so um, it'll be our, our one and only focus next year. I just want to come back to something that you mentioned there, which was that you piloted the self-service program or, or what would enable that program with the user research team before you rolled it out. And then you also mentioned there you had your park wardens, which mm -hmm. were essentially designers that are volunteering their time to help ensure that the park is well maintained and looked after. Mm -hmm. I just want to talk about that for a second because I don't want to underestimate the achievement of that because you talked about culture and in order to generate a positive research culture you have to work with people outside of research operations to achieve that mm. what were the conversations that you were having with people in user research and people in design to enable this to happen mm. Um, so the first point on this is, is uh, I was speaking to someone the other day and showing them this and, and I realized, oh my God, this is my first, my third community just <laughs> in, internally. Um, again, it's kind of bringing people together on a voluntary basis. Um, it was very interesting because we ran an early adopter program with eight teams outside of research and impact. And so our piloting was kind of twofold. First, we built and piloted um, within the research team. And when we had learned from the researchers, also what they agreed with in terms of quality. Um, mm. You know, we had three platforms um, that do sort of like the user interviews, uh, respondent, askable, are sort of the three main ones. Mm -hmm. um, and we chose the one that we chose for, um, for, for, you know, reasons of quality and it suited us. But we couldn't have gotten there without that in engagement with the researchers and them using that tool. And so um, they helped us really in, in maybe in an unknowing way, but they helped us shape up what our park pathways would look like and where they would go um, and what trees would keep and what would get cut down. Um, and then when we took it out into the wider organization, we picked eight teams um, um, and worked with them. And it's those those design leaders I spoke to and said, is there someone on your team who might like to uh, be an enabler of research in their team? And so um, we were unsure of what a, a research champion would become, but they would pick someone who was look, was a really great collaborator and multiplier mm -hmm. um, and was was like genuinely keen on on helping to make research more easily done within their team. And the teams were so desperate for, remember we'd kind of stepped away and left the mind dry for a little while in order to come back with something that was much more sustainable and scalable. Um, and so they were really desperate to have tools that could help this. And so initially we, we had kind of a very, very ill-defined uh, or, or well-defined in the sense that it had very little definition, which actually suited that context of what a champion would be. And we were thinking, well, this would be to bring us feedback from the team and tell us when something wasn't working well mm -hmm. um, and to uh, come to meetings and really understand our processes um, so that they knew what tool was coming out when or to send people to the handbook or what channel that they should like ask on in Slack, things like that, so that we just get a lot less of those questions. Uh, we don't get any of those questions from the team members because the champion handles that all. Mm -hmm. But what the champions did was they took that those sort of more administrative um, tasks um, and they they elevated the role to something that we hadn't expected, which is beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, and they started to, as the person who had access to the recruitment tool, which at that point had a budget on it, we, we allocated 25 participants per team per quarter. Mm -hmm. um, that allocation of budget and that constraint uh, meant that teams were starting to prioritize what research could happen and when. Mm -hmm. And the other constraint is time. It's not like unmoderated. You can't throw it in and leave it and come back and have insights overnight. Um, you have to spend time with people and you've got to do the recruiting. Mm -hmm. it, you know, the recruiting had gone down from two weeks to a week, depending on the complexity of your recruit, but it was a lot quicker using these tools and processes. Um, but uh, they then became these kind of... Um, 
people who were leading the discussion and working with their leadership on what research was important and when, which then kind of rolls up into roadmaps and and yeah. and what needs to happen. And so um, the, the the champions who really kind of took on that role. Um, they love it. And uh, some of them recently, when we've now um, expanded to the entire organization beyond those first eight teams, actually just a couple of weeks ago, um, they, they said, you know, as long as I can keep my role as a champion, I'm happy. Um, and so we've now got, I think it's 18 or 19 champions in total um, who are helping us to to keep the, the wheels turning. Mm-hmm. And how did you manage to negotiate the time that they're investing in enabling research operations on a volunteer basis with the leader of design or whoever yeah. is uh, responsible for those designers. You know, it's so interesting. We just didn't even talk about it. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, we we didn't uh, we didn't have a huge definition around it. Um, we allowed them to create their own space. There are no formal demands on it. Mm-hmm. Um, there is uh, there are a couple of things we like them to do. We we like to meet with them one-on-one. Someone in my team will meet with the champion each quarter to get their feedback on a one-on-one basis. Mm-hmm. And we will analyze that and produce a, a report with some actions against how we're going to progress. Um, and we have a town hall um, once a quarter, which now we ask the champion, a champion, like a, a Hall of Fame champion we now have to share back um, what they've achieved that quarter. Um uh, but that's it. That's all we really ask for. And then there's a little kind of slacking upwards and down of, on things. But um, uh, they've they've kind of made it into their own space. Um, and so we've never talked about time. Hmm. Not yet anyway. Hmm. Might still come up. Well, let's hope, let's hope that it doesn't because it's a great way to grow <laughs> the research ops practice without actually having to grow your, your own headcount. Head yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've always, I always felt that uh, my goal has always been to deliver as much as possible with a small team, like a small mm. team that packs punch, but a small team of people who aren't burnt out. Mm. Um, that, that's always been really important. I um I seem to recall that you are known as K Cops within the team. Yes. Is that yes. still the case? Well, with K Cops, um, it's affectionately called that now because pre COVID, um, when everybody was still in offices, um, we actually did physically send cakes to the office. And so someone would be at the office and be greeted by a cake. And for the odd remote person, they'd get a cake at their door. But with COVID, that became a logistical nightmare. Um, And so we'd now do Mm -hmm. e-cards and uh, swag boxes on occasion for the team. So it's it's, K-Cops has now come to kind of mean anything that is of joy. Um, (laughs) (laughs) But yes, uh, maybe one of these days we get back to an actual K-Cops. But uh, it's quite a challenge with all the various like dietary requirements and addresses and cakes. (laughs) Cakes were arriving at homes, but at the wrong home that people had moved and now their cake was sitting outside on someone else's door and all sorts of things. <laughs> it's, it seems to me that the the impact that you're trying to have with KCOPS was to acknowledge the efforts of the team, but you've also spoken about in the past the demands that operations places on people, and I think you uh, experienced that initially when you sort of went out to the wider organisation and you said, oh, if you need to recruit, we can help you, and then we're overwhelmed. What do people that are managing research ops teams need to be mindful of in terms of the well-being, the mental well-being of their of their people, and what are the clues mm-hmm. that those things might be out of balance? You make a great connection there because what KCOPS offers is um, there can be some kind of day-to-day role over stuff um, in research ops. Um, there's we don't have a huge amount of admin, but there certainly is. Uh, someone on my team sends thank you gifts, for instance, and does uh, a lot of the uh, sort of financial accounting type stuff that the procurement and things like that, that can get quite kind of heavy and dry. And so having something like KCOPS that is like an instant service and a hospitality piece that uh, they can reach out to the research team. Uh, we don't deliver KCOPS to anyone outside of the RNI, our research and insights team. Mm-hmm. Um, so we don't serve the entire organization with cake, but um, <laughs> something that kind of is like instant joy. Um is really it's it's a lovely light lift for someone on your team um, and it helps them have a direct um, and known impact um, with the research team which is not like a lot of the stuff in research ops can be behind the scene and I was actually speaking to a research the other day and saying what can become demoralizing in um, research operations in an organization is that you're you're like um, I don't know if you're into Formula One I am but um Mm-hmm. you have various levels that help deliver the, the driver having a successful race. And so you'll have 
uh, sort of offsite, say, like back in England, for instance, that you'll have the strategists and a whole team of people sitting there behind the scenes looking through data and working things out and sending messages back to the paddock, uh, like at the race course. Got it. And then you've got, you've, you know, you've got the people, the engineers and everybody actually building um, the mechanics, building the car and making, keeping that running. And then you've got the pit crew who are making all that happen. And then you've got sort of, sort of executives and strategists on, on the pit lane. Um, and then you've got the driver, who's really the person that's on camera and, and getting the the credit. And so we're sitting like very often right back at the backside there. And it can often feel like you're you're working very, very hard. And if you're good at the job, no one knows you're there. Mm. Like it's, it's all happening so seamlessly and well and effortlessly that no one knows you're there until it's broken or not working as well as desired. Mm. And, and that can be pretty difficult for a research ops team to manage and it can be demoralizing at times. And so something that KCOPS does is um, it also brings in some of that direct connection with the, that sort of drive mentality mm. um, of, of being like in, like being on the paddock with the cars and the, you know, the cameras and the lights and the action. Um, it, it, it brings in some of that kind of directness um, when what you're doing is kind of procuring tools and bringing infrastructure together. And although it's all wrapping up into culture change and bigger strategies, when you boil it, when you boil those big visions and strategies down, it demands running spreadsheets and, you know, like being very, very tactical. Um, mm. So KCOPS is fun and, and you need that. Mm. Um, I, I think... Uh, uh, so speaking to this researcher, she was saying, you know, it's funny because I had assumed that the researchers were the Formula One driver getting the, the kind of get, getting the spotlight. And she said, actually, we feel like we're the pit crew and uh, the designer feels like they're somewhere stuck in between the pit crew and, and the racetrack and the product managers are the, are the Formula One drivers. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought that was such an, an interesting extension of the analogy. Um, and I'm sure the product manager will say, it's not me, really, there's someone else that is the Formula One driver who's, who's getting the, the kudos. Sounds like that could be a, a good team exercise to do across departments. Yeah. yeah, it could be. It's kind of fun. <laughs> so thinking about the machine that you've created to enable this F1 car to run effectively and efficiently, what are the ways in which you are measuring the performance of the research operations team? Mm. This, uh, it's um, metrics are a constant question, and one of the things I've learned um, is that you have to have operations in place to start generating data on a mm. like consistent basis in order to get to metrics. And the metrics only become a value when you've been in that space of consistency and measurement for, uh, you know, like six months, uh, a year. Like we really mm. need a full financial year to be able to see how we're tracking and performing. And you need several years to really start to see efficiencies. Mm -hmm. And so none of this stuff is a quick turnaround. Um, so I've been at Atlassian for two and a half years. Um, we've gone through this journey of, of desert to, to jungle, to national park, and then national park with um, wardens. Um, <laughs> Uh, or, or kind of tour guides in a, in a sense, although they're much more than that now. But um, mm. in the midst of that, it's sort of only really as we've got an international park that we've got about um, just coming on 12 months now of data. Um, and I've got someone on my team now who is focused on finances and tracking finances. And what we're, we're working with is that the finances obviously tell you what you're spending, um, but they also tell interesting, there's an interesting narrative that, that is, is emerging from, if you're sending thank you gifts out for the entire organization to participants, um, who's sending the most thank you gifts when? Mm. Um, and does that mean that that team, what sort of research are they doing? And is that a good opportunity to then go in and try and get them to get a full-time research QHP? Uh, because What's they're obviously a QHP? Doing, uh, QHP, good point. Actually, no one I know knows the analogy for that, including me, but it's a head count. Right. Okay. Yeah, this is Atlassian jargon that just like rolled off the tongue. Got it. Um, so, you know, like is it, when you see someone's doing like a team is sending out a lot of thank you gifts, uh, what research are they doing and where are those reports and what kind of research is it? And do they need a headcount? Is that a better investment for them? Mm. Um, and so the finances and tracking the finances can be a really interesting way of drawing out narrative around how, how research is starting is functioning within the organization. Mm. And all you're doing is uncovering uh, sort of patterns that are already there, but just were untracked before. Mm. Um, so we're, we're currently working towards that. But, you know, if you, we were to speak again in a, a year's time, um, I, I would have good answer probably to two things is um, how do you actually track the impact, not just of research ops, but of, of research as well. Um, I, I don't know anyone who's doing a great job of that yet. Um, 
and that's I think a lot of that is you, operations need to be mature to even start to look at that. Um, and the second thing is like the metrics that you can draw out uh, is certainly, you know, how much money you're spending per participant um, across all your different methods for recruitment. Um, has that driven down? Do you want to drive that down? Is it purely about getting quality up? Um, mm -hmm. Or is it about getting speed up? You know, what what are your what are your metrics look like? Um, even quality of participants, we've looked at metrics around that, and that's that's a, a really interesting debate around what is a quality participant. Is it that they're pitched up on time? They were who they said they were. Um, mm. You know, how do you kind of rate that quality? Um, so, it's so many interesting things for us to work on on yet. Yeah, and presumably those metrics tie back to what the objectives of research operations look like in your organisation. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but, you know, I think uh, speaking to our, our, one of our executives the other day and, um, you know, I actually drew a, 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 something, a deck I made yesterday. I've got a, an image and, and it's an arrow going up to the right of the number of people we're looking after, which is now um, 400. Um, and then an arrow of the growth of the research ops team, which is now six. And I've been trying to work out what is that gap between the two? Like, how many people more would I need to look after another hundred people? And so what we've managed to do is deliver something that is scalable. And I can start to get a sense of the measurement of how, how much could I scale to mm -hmm. before I need more people. And, and my scaling is at a significantly lower rate than the number of people I can scale to. And I worked out, I think it was... Um, one of one person to 80 people with the operations I've got in place at the moment, um, yeah. give or take. That's huge, Kate, because I was listening to one of your talks a couple of days ago and you were giving a ratio then of one research ops person to 15 researchers. Yeah. Yeah. And that it's interesting because at the time I remember us debating, um, debating this. I remember the moment we were actually in, in my one of my team members' cars driving over San Francisco Bridge, and we were busy debating: is it actually, you know, uh, is it actually one to fifteen? What is what is it? And um, I think um, in a full service model, um, you would need to keep growing. Every fifteen, you would need to keep growing another person. Um, and of course, then with management structures, once you have like five to eight, you'd need to have a manager in there, and so you've got to add on one. Mm. Um, but when you uh, get into well, reasonably well organized self service structures, and and I'm always going to look at what we do and say there's more work to do. I'm never going to mm. not say that. Mm. Um, but uh, you, your scale changes completely because now you need highly skilled and uh, like um, mature people to design and, and people who understand service design mm. um, and understand their space, whether it's privacy or recruitment or technology or whatever kind of operational or finances, whatever oper operational space they're working on, they need to understand those things and be able to design systems that um, are scalable. Um, and that's their job. Um, and then you need a brand of people in your team eventually. Um, and, and at some point, I will need these people who are going to maintain those services. And there are more administrators. Mm -hmm. But they're not admins like I, I kind of jumped on the word admin earlier, um, which is sort of like one-on-one -on -one personal assistance yeah. for every need. These are people who are now administrating the services you've built and kept them running. Administrating so at scale. They're exactly perfectly put. They're administrating at scale. Um, and then you start to get the sort of balanced team. Mm. Um, so yeah, the, the scale picture changes entirely. So let's update that one. At the moment, we're, we are running at one to 80, mm -hmm. um, but that's a, it's a very rough kind of, it's, it's a rough cut because the more you scale, the more admin comes in. Um, and mm -hmm. so you, you would need to actually build up your admin side and probably keep your service design kind of specialist side um, growing slower than the admin side would. So um, it's a difficult one. But uh, mm. I think at the moment, I'd probably be asking for like 1 to 80 at the very minimum. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like it's evolving as as you evolve the operations practice. Things, mm -hmm. things change naturally. Yeah, they do. In the time that you've been there, so your 2.8 years that you touched on before, what are you most proud of? I... Um... I have to say the first thing that comes to mind, um, and this goes back to your question around KCOPS, is I'm actually most proud of the fact that I've I've got a small team, um, now six in total, as I said. Um, we are distributed across the world. I've got two in the States. Um, and we're managing to deliver services to 
hundreds of people in the organization and, and have a, a marked impact on, on how they see things. Um, and be a happy team. We definitely have our stressful moments, but it's a very happy, fun team. And I've always seen that as, as a, like a success marker, that, that you're, you're having a good time with what you're doing. Mm. And you get together and as a team, you, you can have fun. And so we, we do things like we, we run on sprints, um, we run Agile. So every two weeks we have a sprint retro and a planning and we really kind of dig through um, kind of where we can improve things and uh, what's going mm. on. And during those calls, we always have some kind of like Motown music running in the background while we're kind of <laughs> working through things. And, and we, we as a team... Rock. Not punk rock. No, I don't. I haven't like uh, uh, pushed that onto the team yet. <laughs> but um, yeah, we we have a good time, and I and I think that's if you can point at a team who's having a good time, who are growing, who um, are, are smiling in meetings, and are doing really effective work at the scale that they are. Um, that that's really what I'm most proud of. Mm. Mm. Well, that's a great point to shift gears and. Do some scenario-based questions if you're up for those. Yeah, go for it. So these are really designed to help people that might be in a scenario in the question that they can relate to. And I've got three of them, and we'll just jump into them and see how it goes. Are you ready? Yes. Okay. All right. Here we go. Scenario number one. You wake up one day, and you find that your dream of becoming a research ops manager has come true. Your business case has been accepted. After the initial excitement passes, it's time to get down to business. What do you focus on first? Hmm. I'm actually thinking back to my first day at Atlassian. Um, the first thing to focus on is really understanding your context. Um, I, I run a one-day course um, and a lot of research leaders and directors and things come to it. Um, mm. I haven't run it since COVID, but... Uh, perhaps in the future. Mm -hmm. And one of the questions that I have as homework preparation is, uh, what is your context around research, which is broad? You know, how many people are doing research in your organization? Mm -hmm. um, is it centralized or is it um, democratized? Um, what is the research strategy? And if you're the research leader and, uh, you know, where are you thinking of taking things? So surprising. I remember being stunned um, because I had that as a naive question uh, as, the, as part of the preparation. And it's the question, what is your research strategy that came back with the most blank stares? Um, people <laughs> didn't know what research strategy is and hadn't thought about it. Um, and I think that's a sign of um, sort of the, the, the maturing of research at scale, um, mm. where research, sort of mature research leaders, and this is not to say that those who aren't, aren't mature, you can get excellent craft leaders, mm -hmm. but who haven't yet thought about, um, you know, what is, what is our research strategy? Where are we? kind of going and, and operations can really help um, shaping shape that up. And yeah. so that partnership between the two should dovetail. And so it's really good to understand if you don't have a strategy, why not? Um, what mm. might the strategy be? Should you have a research strategy? Would it be helpful to? Mm. Um, and so there's a ton of questions that you can do that are really kind of those curious discovery questions around who are we, where are we going, where do we want to go? Um, and it's sort of, it, it's good not to make a move until you've, You've, you know that because had I known and t taken the time to think about the fact that there were what I now know is 500 people who potentially do research at Atlassian, I sure would not have hired someone and stuck a service desk up and said, I'm going to offer recruitment to all of you. But I didn't <laughs> didn't take the time to, to do that basic, basic, basic questioning and to do some basic questioning of my specialist that I had hired as to whether this was even a viable like um, service to offer it was just mm -hmm. kind of like like full guns all guns blazing mm -hmm. um, so it's good to like pause understand do a discovery um, do a discovery about all the things that you you like might not think to be obvious don't just speak to your researchers speak to privacy speak to finance um, speak to technology speak to anyone who you think might be interested in the work that you're doing and how you might impact them mm -hmm. account managers even um, they might be sensitive mm -hmm. about who you're recruiting or not recruiting for research and so on and so forth so you can get a, a a big kind of picture of of, of um, where you might want to go and what your success story might look like in three or four years time. Um, mm. uh, and that also means that you can come to your research leader and, and if you're not the leader, um, if you've been hired, then, um, which I think is your scenario, um, you can show right from the start that you aren't just there to do full service recruitment and show those very quick 
winds which are you know it's, it's hot air it just it evaporates as soon as it's out you know it's gone um and and so you can get buy-in for that longer term vision and for the how long it might take to deliver it but the the overwhelming winds that you'll experience in the long run um, for which we are a case study excellent yeah in this scenario this follow-up is going to be quite topical then from from what you touched on there where you did put in place that specialist and then quickly had that overwhelm are you ready yeah your team is under-resourced and work-life balance is suffering. You want to demonstrate to management that research ops is adding value so you can grow the team and take some of the pressure off. How are you best to do that? Mm. Oh, it's a constant, it's a constant piece. Um, one of the, the ways that I've done this um, is to be very, very specific about what you're going to deliver and what you're not going to deliver. And so, mm -hmm. People will be feeling the squeeze for something all over the place. And um, if you run around trying to fix up everything to make everybody happy, um, you're going to burn yourself out doing it. It's not sustainable. And you also just become that kind of quick fix person. Um, mm. Now, there's a difference between an architect or, or like a, someone who builds skyscrapers and the handyman. You do not want to become the handyman who's just called for every little nail that needs to be kind of hammered into the wall so true. Um, and so um, one of the ways of doing that kind of as you said like it hooks on nicely to that previous piece um, you need to show the plan for the skyscraper and that you are capable of building it but it's going to take time but there is going to be such a view from the top that you're going to be stunned by it mm -hmm. and that will buy you time um, and and get you get your team motivated with a vision of where they're going um, to be able to start delivering on floor one two three but you need to make floor one, two, and three usable so that there are early wins to be seen too. You can't be like, well, I'm just going to spend three years building the skyscraper and then you'll be able to get the elevator to the top floor and it's going to be epic. Uh, you need to have like floor one functioning within the first year and working. And, and that's really where um, we came in with rolling out to the researchers something, these disconnected tools that had little quirks in them that weren't quite right, but they were there. Um, and so the plumbing wasn't quite quite fitted, but uh, you could, you know, you could, you could get a, a water bucket over there and throw it over yourself if you needed a bath. And so, <laughs> you know, it was it was the beginnings. And so you are offering things early on, uh, but you keep hold of that vision towards getting to the penthouse. Um, that's 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 what's worked for us. There, there has been also um, a lot of calm defending of the space and just mm -hmm. being you never say no. Um, you always say yes, and I need X Y Z to do it. Good very technique. happy, to, yeah, very <laughs> happy to deliver it to you. There's not a button there. There's not a no in there. Yes, of course I can do that for you, and I would need this, this, and this, and I'd need six months. <laughs> um, if you can give those things to me, then we're on our way. Um, so there's never a no. So, and those things have worked quite well for me. Mm. Who, uh, taught, who taught you those things, Kate? How did you learn that? I think um, I, I come from a content strategy background, uh, which is uh, I've always been like a, I used to be a, a journalist. I used to write screen um, radio documentaries and things. So mm -hmm. communication has been kind of core to my life forever, mm -hmm. um, which is always a weird thing to say because all of us speak. But um, uh, kind of knowing your words and understanding what you're saying and the impact that they have um, has been on my mind for many long, like long time. Um, and, and one day I just realized that I just, you, know, you don't want to say no because that just gets someone's back up. Um, and, but um, I was at a, conference that my friend runs called Thinking Digital in the UK. Um, Herb Kim, um, he runs that. And it's a great kind of annual conference. And uh, he had someone who was speaking about speaking on stage. And he said, avoid the word but, mm. because but kind of like, again, it puts that emphasis in a sentence of I'm about to disagree with you in a nice way. Mm. Um, and so I remember thinking about that and thinking, okay, so take out buts, put in ands, <laughs> and then thinking, take out the no's, but put in the yes. And so you get a yes and. I've got one to add to that as well, which is instead of using a why question, use a what. Because ah. it's, it's less confronting as a why do you think that or why did you do that? You can ask a what was it about that or something similar. Which That's can cool. Diffuse it. Okay. Oh, I like that. And so you'd say, um, what would you do about that? Mm. What, are, what are your first thoughts? Mm. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Okay. I'd have to, I'm going to have to think about that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it definitely takes some practice because in the flow of conversation, you still catch yourself having a, like a butt comes in there. But uh, no one minds when you reverse and just go, you know what, actually going to change that to a yes and. Um, I think it's it's uh, it's nice for someone to see your your thinking process. Yeah, yeah, and you're being mindful of, of how they're receiving what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, mm. exactly.
Rather than doing the final scenario and just being mindful of time, let's play a quick game instead. Are you up for that? Yeah. Okay, cool. This one is pretty easy. It's called, what's the first word or thing that comes to mind? And I've got three words or phrases and I'll, I'll just run through them and you just tell me what you, what you see or what you think. Cool. Okay. The first one is recruitment. People. Crowds mm -hmm. of people. <laughs> Hordes of people overwhelming Hordes of people. the specialists. I see, yeah, I see like 500,000 people. <laughs> Lots of cakes being sent. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The next one is GDPR. GDPR. Um, I think of good relationships with privacy. I often have like a little heart emoji that I use in documents because uh, it's vital to have a good relationship with privacy and they are thrilled when you have it with them. So a heart emoji. That's, that's a really insightful point there. It's something that I've heard a couple of times in recent weeks is just people investing the time to go and speak with people that might be mm -hmm. in privacy or legal or risk or in charge of ensuring that the organization's best interests are looked yeah. after. They often feel like they're the handbrake on things yeah. and just having a conversation with them is a really cathartic experience for them and also can open doors for you. So Absolutely. And, and they really are so thrilled when someone respects their work and... <laughs> and wants to work with them. And mm. I've only ever had excellent relationships with information security, privacy, legal, so on and so forth. Mm. Um, so yeah, it's definitely a heart emoji. <laughs> and the final word is cake. Cake. Well, I just see cake now. <laughs> <laughs> what kind um, of cake? Yeah, I, I'm seeing like the little, again, maybe I'm, I think in emojis now, and I think it's a problem we all have. Um, <laughs> there's a little emoji I learned, I used earlier for a team member's birthday. And it's a... It's a little, um, like one of those kind of animated emojis with a little cake slice that comes out. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's such a great connector. I'm gluten-free, very strictly so. Um, and uh, so mine's always gluten-free. But uh, yeah, it's such a great thing to gather around a cake and, and celebrate mm. something. Um, it's the simple things that uh, should not be lost in, in, in the midst of, of the rush of life and, and things going on. So that's, that's important, bringing people together. That's a nice notion to draw us down to the final question of today's conversation, which is thinking about where research ops is now, what is your greatest hope for the field over the coming years? That's a great question. Um, it it kind of goes back to that simple thing of, you know, we're, we're pretty nascent as a space and, and I think it's important to note that it's not, some people will say, oh, well, you, you invented research ops. And it's like, no, I just made it, I marketed it mm -hmm. in ways that it hadn't been marketed before. But uh, Microsoft had had a research ops team of varying sizes up to 20 for, and more, I think, even for 20 years now. Um, and Facebook and, and Google have had research ops teams for a long time, and they were called that. Um, but as a sort of a more broadly known space where now research operations jobs are popping up left, right and center, which is wonderful. Mm. I would love to see that um, uh, the people hiring for this and well done. But when people are hiring for this, that they're not hiring someone who isn't a senior strategist who really understands operations and depending on their scale, that they intend on building a team around them to help them to do this work well. Mm. Um, it is work that is meant for scale um, and, and it's sort of a weird word that it gets used and I use it all the time in that notion where it's like well at what scale small or big you know scale isn't a kind of a, a, a great descript on its own but it's 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 designed to it's 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 at its best when it's in a space where it is working at into the dozens and hundreds yeah. um, if you're a team of five researchers you're hiring a personal assistant yeah. you're not hiring you don't need um a research ops person at that point. If you're a team of 10, it's useful to start with an ops person, but only if you're really going to start growing into the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s. Um, and so I would love for the industry to really start to understand that strategic goodness at wizardry that sits within research ops um, and to move from the notion, um, which I think is starting to happen, that, it, that it's just about procuring tools and and recruiting people like white glove servers mm. um it, it, it has got so much more value in it and 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 we're only just now getting into the really interesting stuff at atlassian it's taken us two and a half to, years to build that foundation mm. um and i'm excited to see what happens when leaders wake up to the real value that's locked up inside um of their operations efforts
Yeah, and I would love to talk with you again, maybe in 12 months and mm. just hear how that journey's gone, you know, being the API and bringing in yeah. more of, I think you called it quantops and something else that I was reading, you know, how, how you can actually move research ops from efficiency into something that's more meaningful and has more impact. What yeah, a, absolutely. Yeah, what a great thought to close yeah. on, Kate. Great. Thank you. It's been such a wonderful and insightful conversation. There's been so much valuable insight in there that you've shared with us about the, re about the research ops field, Kate. So thank you so much for making the time. Yeah, and thank you for doing such good research and answering or asking such excellent questions. It was um, very, very uh, thought-provoking even for me. My pleasure. And I'm sure the people that are, who are listening to today will get a lot of value from what you've shared. Kate, if people want to follow you, find out what you're up to and hear more of your insights, what is the best way for them to do that? Um, LinkedIn under Kate Towsey. Um, you search me there. And uh, Twitter is at Kate Towsey as well. Uh, T-O-W-S for sugar E-Y is how I say it. <laughs> um, and I've started to do, um, well, I'd like to say the weekly, but they're really not, uh, YouTube vlogs on um, as I write my book the things I'm thinking about and uh, uncovering and learning um, so I, I put those out by LinkedIn and Twitter as well so you'd find those there if you're interested in kind of little like research ops thought bubbles um, and that's that's the, those are the best places um, LinkedIn I, I get back to kind of once a month so you'd have to be patient um, <laughs> but uh, I do get back to everybody eventually Great. And it's great to hear about the vlogs as well. I'll be linking to all of that in the show notes for you, Kate, so people can great, find it thanks. easily. Great. And they're on YouTube. So, Perfect. Perfect. And to everyone that's tuned in, it's great to have you here as well. Everything we've covered will be in the show notes, including, as we've just talked about, where you can find Kate, where you can also find the Research Ops community and any of the other resources that we've covered today. If you've enjoyed the show and you want to hear more of these great conversations with world-class leaders in UX design and product, don't forget to leave us a review and subscribe to the podcast. And keep being brave.